have the pleasure of welcoming everyone to the second session in our 2020 Strategies in Cytotechnology Education Series. And today's topic is Recruiting Future Laboratorians, Trials and Triumphs. Um, just a few housekeeping items um, before we jump into things. Um, as you'll probably remember from our last presentation given by Keisha, we're asking everyone to keep yourselves on mute during the presentation. Um, but of course, if you have any questions or comments you wanna share, um, please feel free to use the chat box and um, Debbie and I will be um, trying to monitor that throughout the presentation. Um, now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Barbara McGahee Frain. She's the Assistant Professor and Program Director of our Cytotechnology Program um, at the Indiana University School of Medicine Cytotechnology Program. Her passion for our profession is clearly demonstrated by, by her active involvement in numerous professional societies and um, at the state level as well, as well as her participation in international um, missions to Botswana and in Peru to help with cervical cancer screening. She's equally passionate about cytotechnology education. This is her rookie year um, as program director for the program and it unfortunately coincided with the pandemic this year. And she's sure she needs a do-over um, as program director for her rookie year. But I think we're gonna see from her presentation today that Barbara possesses a huge wealth of knowledge um, in this arena um, that she'll be sharing with us. So without further delay, um, here is Barbara. Thank you, friends. I'm gonna go video off and hopefully we'll do full screen with the, uh, with the talk. And there it is, uh, full screen. So I took this title from a poster uh, that a group of us presented in uh, the fall of 2018 at the ASCP meeting in Baltimore. I think it was two years ago. Um, I had gone to a, a promotion and tenure workshop and I had a very inspiring uh, teacher who said, he was an MD, he said, whatever it is you're working on, you should be writing about it. Because you should do posters and abstracts and a paper, which we haven't in the paper yet, but this presentation is, um, is gonna give me some good incentive, I think, to get that paper completed. So I made objectives for you today, since that's what we do. I wanted to share our data-driven experience. And I'm going to ask you at the ends of this, end of this, if you will, please um, let me know something that maybe we, we brought up or talked about that you, you could incorporate. And I would like to know what's working for you. And then uh, maybe we just have a few minutes to brainstorm, collaborate, and think and talk about what we will hopefully be doing together next fall uh, when we're together again. I'm very hopeful out in the Las Vegas area. I just have to tell you when I heard Keisha speaking last week and I had this like pang of homesickness is the only way I could describe it for our meeting and for sitting in a room with you guys and bouncing these ideas off each other. I just, I really missed everyone and I, I really, missed not being with you at the meeting more so than when I did the virtual meeting, which I thought was extraordinarily well done. So uh, I'm really glad to be with you here today in this capacity, even though I wasn't doing this in Orlando, looking forward to going to the Haunted Mansion afterwards. But what happened for us in about 2012 was that we just hit an all time low in applications for our program. We can take eight at any given time, any given year as what the build out is for us physically with a number of workstations and scopes and rotation sites and things like that. It's what our department has agreed upon that we can, we can uh, provide a good experience for. You can see here we had, we had 12 applicants or we had nine applicants and we had years where we were not uh, even close to capacity. And so I was charged with finding out what ClinLab was doing because the program director at that time said, well, they seem to have plenty of applicants, why don't we? And so that became my task to find out what was going on. Now, uh, I did not include the ClinLab data here. You'll see it later on a little mini look at the poster, but they were also experiencing some erratic 
ups and downs in their qualified applications. So um, a now retired program director, Linda Marler for ClinLab said, you know, we, we should work on this together. It seems like we're competing for the same students, but not necessarily so. And we would do uh, lab visits and then uh, the same student would visit Clin Lab later that week, and we just felt like we were duplicating effort. And so I will share with you some of the ways that we decided to collaborate. So the perception that Clin Lab was really just uh, loaded with applicants was not exactly true when we started looking at the data. We've always historically had a loose goal of two people per one seat. So if we're going to fill eight seats here, we'd like to have 16. And um, that is where we are most comfortable. So this was a low enrollment year. Uh, this recruitment for this group would have started around 2012, 2013. And we had six and we would have only had five. And I got to point out little Jessica here. She's living and working in the New York and uh, New Jersey area. Uh, she came to us because she had applied for the UCLA program. She decided she wanted to leave the East Coast and try out West Coast living for a year. And um, Mary Levin at UCLA said, well, we're, we're full. I mean, you know, you could be on a wait list here, but we, I think that Dr. Crabtree put the word out to this group that IU was uh, not full. And so the courtesy of Mary Levin, little Jessica applied for us. And rather than getting to experience life on the West Coast, she experienced a year in Indiana, but she is grateful for that experience, or so she tells me. Uh, and I just have to share that this was a, a year in recent history where we had not yet experienced the fruit of our efforts uh, with recruitment. So that was a low, a low volume year. So we started brainstorming with our friends and colleagues in the Clin Lab program, but also our other health professions programs. So we're part of a, a group that includes several levels of radiologic sciences, uh, bachelor's level respiratory therapy, bachelor's level uh, radiation therapy. Um, I'm trying to think of who else is all at that, nuclear medicine. Uh, quite, a few, quite a few groups are together through the school of medicine with what we call health professions programs. Now, when you're working in, you know, Radio, radiographic science, I think there is not a shortage of applicants. And even now respiratory therapy um, has been spotlighted with a increased survival and treatment for COVID. They generally don't have trouble finding people. People are aware of what they do. Nobody knows what Clin Lab and Cyto do. And so we made a plan to reach out to our health science advisors to professors in certain particular key spots, which I'll detail for you. We started uh, an, an email list uh, from campus events that we went to. We had some clever ways to get their emails. Um, we started doing classroom presentations together with ClinLab faculty and just making sure we had a presence at various campus events. Some are more uh, yield more than others, and I'll talk to you about what those what those are like for us. And we're just very cognizant that when we do something like co-hosting the HPV documentary, which we now do every fall during career week, that we can invite our major players like our health uh, major advisors and these certain professors who tend to refer people to our program they will recognize, man, this student absolutely loves a microscope. Have you thought about cytotechnology? So we're also going to address some website and social media involvement. So the, the benefit, but also the challenge of maintaining contact with particularly health major advisors is that there's a lot of turnover in that group. Some of these advisors are maybe in their first job out of school. Uh, they're young, which is great. They're energetic, which is great. They have lots of ideas for what we could do to reach out to students who might be interested, but they leave quickly. They'll move on to another area of specialty or they'll move up in the ranks. And so it's been a real challenge for us to keep track of who is where and, and when. Um, the biology and anatomy professors tend to stay a little bit more stable, but sometimes we'll have someone who's been a great resource for us and, and he or she will retire. And then we'll have to establish ourselves with the, with the, new, uh, the new professor. Fortunately for us, right here in Indianapolis at IUPUI, the anatomy professor is great at helping us 
figure out uh, who would be good for our field. He teaches a 200 level anatomy class and he now teaches a 400 level, level cadaveric anatomy class, which has been a great upper level elective for our students. Um, one of our other main campuses for Indiana University is in Bloomington. And historically there was a great uh, histology professor down there and that was a 400 level class. And I actually went to see him in person. I had him in school and then I was able to attend his last lecture when he retired. But now I, I don't know who the new histology professor is in Bloomington. And so um, keeping up with who's who can be a little bit of a challenge. I like to ask our applicants who some of their favorite professors have been. There's an immunology professor right now I really need to get to know because I guess she's got a really great template for her online teaching and uh, that's something I'd like to get better at and learn more about. There's still some misinformation out there that we're battling. Uh, even with the health majors advisors, they are giving the students the idea that all of the prereqs need to be completed before applying to our program. And that is just absolutely incorrect. Uh, what we do have is a conditional admit. We are interviewing right now. Our application windows opened uh, August 1st and ended December 1st. And um, we have what we call conditional admits. And so it's on the condition that the patient completes the prereqs in the spring semester and even has an opportunity in the summer semester. Maybe they're missing something big like anatomy or physiology, or maybe they're missing something smaller like their second uh, writing credit. There are requirements from IUPUI that have to be met. And so there's time to get those done and they are accepted on the condition that they will complete it successfully and then they'll be able to, to come into the program. I have a hard time wrangling some of these websites. I had a new app, as Kalyani mentioned, it's, it's, my, it's my second rookie year. Um, last year got a little upended, but it is the third year that I've run the admissions uh, myself. And so I get all kinds of questions and I will look to try and find it on my own. And I think, well, no wonder the potential applicant had that question. I can't even find certain things on the website all the time. I, I, example, uh, I, fees, fees and tuition. And so there is a little more seasoned ClinLab faculty member on the hallway. And I told him, I said, I can't even find out exactly. And I do it for my CPRC report, but to the best of my ability, I don't have a number that I can tell these students what in-state and out-of-state tuition are. I actually went back to the CPRC report because I figure at some point in time I found that, but I don't think it includes every little fee for every little, there's a technical something fee, there's a recreation fee, uh, if, things like that. The websites are not real clear about it. And so this more seasoned program director than I said, that's with intention. The university doesn't really want them to know how much they're going to be spending. I'm like, oh my gosh, you have to be kidding me. But we work in medicine, so why should I be surprised that uh, prices and rates and things aren't clear? Um, the other thing we like to do is invite not just prospective students on lab tours, but we like to invite these advisors and these key professors on a lab tour as well. It's been a lot of fun to welcome them into our building and to see what people are doing. And the tours last about 90 minutes. We don't wanna take up a half of their day and we will work with them too. Like if 10 o'clock's not good, but 8.30 is, we'll do it. If two o'clock's not good, but 3.30 is, we don't love that time frame, but we'll do it. We'll get them in here. So we invite advisors and professors to come with us. Mostly our focus though is students who are interested in applying to our programs in the laboratory sciences. We put the word out um, with classroom visits, which I'll talk about in a minute. We put the word out to the advisors, some of whom have been on the tour and they'll say, hey, this is a great way to go. We do collect student emails at campus fairs and we'll send them a message. And we send follow-up once they've indicated interest in coming on a lab tour, we have follow-up regarding building access and what to wear, things like that. If someone uh, does not call me to say that they had car trouble or they're ill or not coming, and I don't know anything of what's going on to reschedule them, I reach out to them and that's kind of twofold for me. Uh, one is you've inconvenienced me. You, you've said you were gonna come. I've set aside these you know, two hours of my morning to give you a tour and you're not here. Uh, and the other is to just help them work on their professionalism moving forward. If they set up an interview, they better show up for that interview. 
So we can hold uh, on a normal day, which this is not a uh, normal situation. We can host up to nine students so that at the end of the tour, we have them all around the multi-headed scope and we show them some examples of cases. So we're just limited by what we're going to show them and they get a lot of satisfaction sitting at the scope, looking at something that by then we will have walked through all the different parts of the lab, even the gross room. So maybe there's been an organ that they've seen like a lung and then we can show them a slide of a lung under the scope and they can really make that connection. So we, we do have a size limit. Usually we end up with five or six on our small group tours. We like to host them um, every month in the spring, usually starting in March when the weather is better. So March, April, May, and June. We will add a fall uh, one if, if we need to. And we haven't been able to welcome anyone into the building since March. So the small group tours have gone by the wayside for the time being. Uh, I mentioned a presence at campus events. And this is an image from, we didn't know it, but this was an image from late February of last year. And two of our students at the time, uh, Nate and Jack Sue, joined me for this tabletop display called Ready Your Roar. This was for admitted high school seniors and their parents to come and do a campus day. So this was an all health professions program event. And so radiation therapy brought this mask, like what someone might wear during a radiation therapy uh, actual visit. I think Clin Lab had these cool um, post-it notes to give out. I don't, I don't see our cytology offering here, but you'll see that in a minute. If students can go, and this is really hard because of our demanding schedule, but if students can go, then the prospective students seem to really gravitate towards that. We have them wear their scrubs and their name tags front and center. Sometimes Josh and I will throw on a lab coat because if a student sees a lab coat across the room, they assume that you're a medical doctor and they rush right over to talk to you because of course they're all going to go to medical school and become a pediatrician or whatever their, their 18 year old hearts desire. Um, the types of events that Josh and I attend include campus visit days, just inquiry days for high school juniors and seniors. Also orientation days, which is what this Ready Your Roar was uh, for admitted high school seniors. And then career week events for people who are enrolled, probably freshmen and sophomores. Here's some more students, uh, more recruitment. Now you can see the sort of things that we have out here. We actually brought an old uh, Nikon scope with us. We showed slides. Uh, if students wanted to look, we had a document here with this is what you're looking at and a little bit of patient history. And then we had some normal cell types over here and we have a little kind of like a flashcard game. Guess what this cell is? Guess what this cell is? This one's a neuron. I don't know if you can see it. This one is striated muscle. And um, we've got one that just shows adipose tissue. And one time I was doing the little flashcard card game with a student and, and it was the adipose. And I said, what do you think this looks like? And she was him and hawing around and I, I slapped my thigh and I go, I've got it right here. And she goes, cellulite. I'm like, oh man, I don't ever want to see you again. But uh, I'm just kidding about that. It was quite an entertaining moment at a, at a career event. Um, we also have plastinated samples. I've got an up close picture of that in a minute to show you. We would have our brochures out. This is an outdated brochure. That's not the one we're doing anymore. Here's the picture of the fat cell. Can you guys see that? I hope you laughed really hard in your office when you heard about the cellulite story. Um, and so this was uh, Angelica and Avery that year. And then we have Sharice and Knife. And how do I persuade these students to come to an event that might be at 3.30 in the afternoon? I give them bonus points in the class if they will show up. And then this is kind of fun because actually both, both of these students on the right who came to this event ended up in our program. They were in two different years, uh, but yeah, that's, um, that is just a testament to how well it worked out. And then this was a student free event. Uh, I don't exactly know which event we were doing on this day, but they had a cutout, which I thought was very effective of a body in scrubs. And then it was kind of a little selfie station and people could, could say, uh, you know, picture yourself in healthcare professions. So that was the job. I think Renee came up with that one. Renee has moved on as well. She was a, one of our uh, health professions advisors 
and uh, now we have a different person in the role. This is Nick Brell. He's a ClinLab faculty member who's been great, great, great help to me as I struggle through my two rookie years in the pandemic. We really just commiserate now. We have a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun getting to know each other. Um, some of these folks are faculty members, not necessarily program directors, and we don't see each other a lot. So when we see each other at these events, we really have a good time. Um, this one, we were sharing table space with another program. That's why there's some blank space over there. And then we've since graduated from this trifold to a cooler looking banner presentation that has some of the similar images on it and gives us some ability to switch things around depending on what kind of group we're talking to. But I don't have a picture of what that banner looks like. We uh, intentionally ordered this tablecloth that goes on any standard banquet table so we can go to any conference anywhere and throw this on there and it says School of Medicine and again we're kind of capturing their attention because everybody plans to go to medical school and, and then they find out that oh you're well oh, you're undergraduate programs and then we tell them of our success rate with our graduates going on to medical school and then they then they feel a little happier they don't necessarily walk away. Uh, this, but they feel like they've been tricked. It's like your tablecloth says school of medicine. Well, we are, but most people didn't know that our school of medicine has an undergraduate component. Uh, this is the actual poster that we presented at the meeting in Baltimore for the ASCP a couple years ago. And this is what I intend to flesh out uh, for the paper. And um, so we just shared our data. Uh, this sort of data is collected by our health professions program faculty members for every program that I mentioned earlier. So we were able to just ask Renee for these numbers and she gave them to us. So um, here, here was ClinLab and like I said, they were a little bit erratic and then they took a big dip in this uh, particular year as well. And then here are our numbers starting to sort of gradually go up for total qualified applicants. We don't interview every applicant. Someone can complete an application, fall short of our minimum GPA, and we won't interview them. And then we also track cumulative grade point averages for every program. This is just showing you Cido in the blue and ClinLab in the orange. So that's not something that I have to do. I, I do it for my program. I submit it to our health professions program office, and they've got data for every program and every year so we can monitor this sort of thing. Uh, here we are down in Bloomington. We had two tables that year. So Bloomington, Indiana is kind of our mothership campus. And um, then this was a different event where I did a little takeoff, probably some copyright infringement here on that Guess Who game. If anybody had kids who played Guess Who or maybe you played it as a kid, and we had new faculty members. So I said, guess who was our new faculty member? And I gave hints like, uh, I don't know. Oh, I know one was has non-dominant eye color. So the students got real close and then we could have a conversation about dominant eye color. And then they got to vote with a slip of paper that had their name and their email on it. And they put them in these beakers. And uh, CK here, whose hair is as gray as mine, if not more, CK was actually one of our new faculty members. But, but so she didn't get very many votes. Uh, but, but Katie and Nick were our younger faculty members. They got a lot of votes, but they were not the new faculty members. So that was just kind of a fun way to make it into a game to engage potential uh, future applicants. And we also captured their contact information. Now, when we go to Bloomington, we usually just have a piece of paper out saying, if you're interested in a lab tour, leave us your name and email. We can also kind of monitor the number of people we might talk to in any given day, which Josh went this past year. And my recollection is we estimate we talked to between 40 and 50 individuals at those events. Um, there is a comprehensive, all of the health professions programs. This is a really colorful one page handout that we have out on the table that the students can leave with. And then these are called rack cards. And rack cards, according to our media specialists in the school of medicine, are much more common than trifold brochures. So according to them, trifold brochures are a thing of the past. And so the, uh, we were the first ones to have rack cards made up. And then they ended up having them made for all of the other professions as well. So we, we had to lay out cash for this, even though it was within the 
um, school of medicine, the school of medicine contracted out a professional photographer who came in and took lots of pictures. I think I've shared a lot of these with Debbie uh, for different things because the students have to sign off on all kinds of uh, legal disclosures saying that it's okay to use these pictures for promotional things. So uh, anyway, there's a student. Why do people always pick this like looking at the slide, not looking through your scope, you're looking at the slide. I don't know why that is, but we left this to the professionals to put these rack cards together. So you can see one side of ours, and then you're seeing the flip side of clinical laboratory science, which has the information that uh, that someone deems necessary. Um, we have two versions of the RAC card because we started out with this in 2015 and then health professions decided it was such a good idea that they made RAC cards for everybody else. So we have two versions of the RAC card and this was the first one. And we, uh, at the direction of our media specialists, they said, can you get some quotes from graduates about what it's like to be working out in the field? And so we did that. And I think you can read this one uh, one of our grads said that I get to do everything I learned at school. Not one day at my job is the same. Interesting cases keep me on my toes and my supervisor is impressed with my contribution to the department. And so for a student taking that home with them from one of these displays, that is better than a faculty member saying, you're gonna do everything you learned in school. So there was a lot of thought that went into that. We we had several writing samples that we collected and and that we submitted and then the media specialists are the ones who decided what goes in the headline and what goes in bold text and what goes in italics you know they study this thing they they know what's supposed to work and and i don't so i just uh, provided what they asked me to do and we set aside a day for the professional photographer and for the videography and now that video for us is like five years old i feel like we need to redo it but it cost um a couple grand to do it. So I don't know if that's in the budget. So I definitely suggest working with a professional to develop these sorts of things. Um, and I just, I'm not a graphic artist specialist. I'm not a social media specialist. And there are people who do that for a living. Fortunately, we work at, at a university and in a city where there are lots of graphic artists and media specialists. So we, we defer to the specialist on that. The only thing I felt like they suggested we do that I didn't think was a big win was this strangely oversized postcard. Uh, if you flip it over, there's a place for me to like write someone's address on it and send it in the mail, uh, which I have done once and I sent it to my dad. And uh, I'm like, look, here's this strangely large picture of me. And um, anyway, that's the one thing I probably wouldn't spend money on again, but I got about, you know, 500 of these. So if if you want me to send you one in the mail, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll put it, you put your address in the chat. I'll send you a postcard. But the funny thing is that, you know, nobody sends anything in the mail anymore. So that's why I think that that was a little misdirection of some of our resources. But I couldn't mock it and talk about it if we hadn't done that. So we take them to, we take them to those career fairs. And if anybody wants anything to do with Sido, we're like, here, have these strangely large postcards. We're just going to send them out to you or hand them out to you. Um, our classroom presentation that we did with, with the ClinLab faculty, we did not have expert consultation on this. It's just something that we've devised uh, over the years. We did use our branded PowerPoint background, which is very red, just like today I'm using the branded, you know, CPRC background. Um, we, we did do that and uh, we change it uh, when we need to. It's not very long. It is, I, I cropped out the number of slides. I think all total, it might be 23 slides long. We feature a lot of images of students doing things. So this is a picture of when we visit the VA and we are making uh, pull smears on sputums, which is one of the gross things we like to talk about. And, and you know, college kids love to hear about gross. That's about the only place and they, they don't even have many sputums anymore. So we're like, just get us a mucoid rock wash or whatever you've got. And um, then we also are always careful for the ClinLab faculty to tell the pinworm story about the tape test for pinworm. It's always a crowd pleaser. And they remember these stories. 
And then after we've gone through this brief PowerPoint, we're usually given 45 minutes to an hour in a classroom. And we only do this two or three times a year. Uh, we take some props and I'm gonna show you those props in a minute. But this year we couldn't go into the classroom. And so we started our presentation by showing a brief video. I think it's less than 10 minutes long. It's called A Life Saved. And it was filmed by the American Society of Clinical Laboratory Scientists, ASCLS. It's a little, I know it's a little bit dated now. I don't think that college students would know that it's dated. Um, and I absolutely recommend that you should look at it and it might be a nice recruitment tool for you because it's about a young boy's uh, diagnosis of leukemia and how basically every part of the lab uh, is involved in his, his treatment and care. And so words scroll past and one of those words is cytology. And so we make sure to point that out. So we showed the video today because we are this year because we couldn't be in the classroom with them. When we are in the classroom with them, we take things like this plastinated uterus. And uh, we have a now retired uh, path assistant who plastinated a lot of organs. And this is what they use now when the medical students can be on campus and they do some hands-on learning in a course that is no longer even called pathology. But that's another, that's another conversation for another day. Um, it's been to our benefit that we had someone who learned plastination because we have a lot of plastinated organs. We do generally keep them in the plastic bags so we don't have you know, 30 people handling these and picking at them. Um, but once we finish the, the brief lecture, we'll kind of shoot to two or three different corners of the room and the Clin Lab people bring Petri dishes and we bring organs. We don't usually take our microscope and slides. It kind of depends on the crowd and the length of time we have and we have them rotate. So if there's a classroom with 21 people in it, we'll divide them into, you know, well, we had three stations, the last one I remember. So we're just like groups of seven, work it out. And they move around the room. And that whole thing takes maybe 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, we're just a few minutes at each station, but it tends to really stay in their, in their memory uh, and they really enjoy it. Another thing that we do that allows us to incorporate advisors and professors and students and potential students is that every fall for the past, I think we've done it six years now, we host this uh, documentary um, during career week. And many of you have seen it. It's an 80 minute long documentary. And we do have a beautiful uh, auditorium. I failed to include a picture of that, I think. Um, we'll welcome people to the auditorium, but this year we did it by Zoom. It's not really designed to be shown that way. It was a little bit laggy. Um, it was closed captioned, which was handy. And then I also, for the Cytos students, uh, I require them to see it. I make it a graded event and I have an active listening worksheet for them to name for me what these women's names were, what their outcomes were, and things like that. So this is more of a learning tool for our students who are already enrolled, but radiation therapy makes sure that their students see it every year as well, because radiation therapy is a big part of this documentary. And I don't think it's great for recruitment, but I do think it's a great way to stay in touch with the professors and the advisors because they're very interested in this as well. And I know that one of our freshman biology courses she also gives bonus points for any of her students who attend and can prove that they were here. So like, I'll just give them one of those postcards and be like, yep, verified that they, they were there and they stayed for the whole 80 minute screening. This year, I actually think we used a different platform than Zoom, but it was one of the online learning platforms and we could sort of take attendance just like we can see today who else on the call, um, we were able to get our count and I forget what it was. I also had to submit that to the university, but we'll continue doing this uh, for the next few years. This documentary as well is getting a wee bit stale, but if people have never seen it before, it's not. And so um, we're, we're planning to do this for the, for the next few years. So in terms of website or social media outreach efforts, um, 
there are a lot of people who indicate that this is how they found us. So that's that's the first interview question I ask um, now. And I think Josh asks that on his interview questions as well. How did you find out about the field of cytology? So a lot of people will say I found it on my own. However, I'm going to provide data for you where last year that wasn't necessarily the truth. A lot of our students have started out maybe in nursing, pharmacy, dental hygiene, forensic science is real big on our campus right now, radiography, radiation therapy. Maybe they don't want that much patient contact. Maybe they did not enjoy the oral cavity uh, idea of looking in people's mouths all day. Maybe they figured out that Forensic science is a field that doesn't really allow for a lot of employment opportunities. That was a huge push on this campus for a number of years. It was a very sexy major, and we've had a number of forensic science people come through Cido when they realized they weren't ever going to get a job being a crime scene investigator. The big hot major right now for us on campus is neuroscience. Well, what are neuroscience grads going to do and how many jobs do they have. So we're capturing a lot of neuroscience people now. Um, what I'm going to do this year, I just had a conversation this morning, is I've got some Twitter feeds that I enjoy and we have an Instagram account that we started and I'm going to share some social media contacts with people uh, if they are interested. And I'm, I'm going to show you what a couple of those are in a minute. But back to me being data-based, uh, I went through the 21 applications that we had last year for the year we're currently in. And here's the breakdown of the answer to that question. And so uh, the biggest thing was people found out about it from their advisor. So I think that tells us it's really important for us to be in communication with the advisors. And I don't mean I'm emailing them every day. I email them a handful of times a year to say, we're having these group tours. That's one email. I set them up for the whole semester and here are the dates and the times. Um, I email them when we're doing, doing the documentary and I'm trying to think if there's any other time I did that. Probably not. I just put it on my Outlook. It's time to email the advisors. And then I highlighted the three in the middle because those were all campus events. So those were three campus events that the students probably saw as a freshman or a sophomore maybe. And then you can see, I thought it was interesting that family, friends, or family members made the list, but they did. I just took them in the order of the interview, and that's how I did it. And then sometimes folks are dual applicants for the ClinLab program. Um, our campus really stresses parallel planning. Like, they, they used to call it Plan A and Plan B, but then Plan B just sort of sounded inferior. So, you know, like first choice, second choice. And so they use the more positive term, parallel planning. And so what if you don't get into the ClinLab program? Because for instance, our ClinLab program requires uh, organic chemistry in lab as a prerequisite, and we do not. So that's just kind of a wall that a lot of students hit. And they, they just think for whatever reason they can't pass organic. And they're like, well, I guess I can apply to cytotechnology, but I gotta tell you, we get some great applicants that way. So I'm not too worried about it. Um, but some people just start out right away like, I don't want to be punching buttons on a machine. And then they also overcome that myth that all they're going to do is look at a microscope. And if they've done that lab tour with us, then they, then they have an idea um, of what the job is going to be about. Another thing that lets them know what the job is going to be about are these videos. And um, I, I will tell you that shadowing is not an opportunity on this campus anymore. Our main affiliate is IU Health. And they have a strict rule about no shadowing. And I really don't miss it. It was a lot to coordinate someone spending a half day. Um, usually the people who want to shadow are not HIPAA trained. They are not infectious, you know, disease protocol trained. We just could not accommodate it anymore. It really wasn't safe for them. And it was a bit of a nuisance to the person they were shadowing. It took time away from task. It was a bit of a distraction. So... The small group tours are a big draw for us now. And then watching a video about what's going on really gives them some good ideas. And this is a generation who's very accustomed to learning that way. You know, if you wanna learn how your new cell phone works, you're gonna watch a video about it. You're not gonna to go to the store and ask someone. So 
these videos are really important. And so our video was one that, as I mentioned, was professionally produced. And so I just took a little screenshot of how it starts right here. That does not look compelling to me at all. Oh yeah, that's exactly what I wanna do, go into a field where people write on a slide. So that's really weird. So here I've got, I captured this one uh, from Mayo Clinic. Look, again, isn't that funny that this is very similar to our professional picture? Oh, there's a cytotech looking at a slide, not putting it on the microscope, but just looking at a slide. You know, there are famous pictures of Dr. Papanikolaou doing this as well. So it's entertaining to me that that's such a common thing. I thought this was a really compelling image from Loma Linda's. You know, I might look at that. Like of the three of them, I think that one is the most engaging for me. I don't know. We could do a poll and find out, but I don't know if we have a chance for a poll um, today or not. If you have the opportunity to chat this or I'm not sure how the meeting is set up, but do you know the length of time a potential applicant will view a video? So does anybody out there in Zoom land know the length of time? And I don't know if you can chat at this point in the program. So everybody just, uh, oh, yay. Sean says 30 seconds. A lot of people say 30 seconds. <laughs> That's a really quick video. OK, people could chat that up. According to the internet, so I'm sure it's correct. It says, yeah, Bridget got it. The length of time is three to six minutes. So I don't know if you all knew uh, that that our very own organization has produced this video, Consider a Career in Cytotechnology. It is one minute and 10 seconds long. And this is another thing that I think I'm gonna have to send out to potential applicants and advisors. I think I can send them our program specific video and it runs five minutes and something. And then I think also it would be nice to share this one um, for one thing, it's it's newer, it's more contemporary, and it's an overall view. But I just I didn't know if if everybody knew that that was available and that the organization, our organization, had made that, produced it. So our personal experience with making our video was uh, that we had to uh, get it set up with the permissions from the School of Medicine, and so the School of Medicine public relations people were on with us the whole day while we did this. We, we devoted about a half a day to it. Um, we had to have the students sign off on the legal forms and also the person who, our pathologist, Dr. Wu, acted like he was doing a needle. And then we had an intern from public relations who was acting like she was the patient if you watch this video. The students were kind of coached up on what to do, um, make sure they said the university name and the program name specifically a lot. I, I think, I think it looks a little contrived in the video, but then I was there for the coaching, so I kind of knew what to expect. Um, once again, just like at these career fairs and wherever, they made sure it was focused on the students. Oh, it's four minutes and 27 minutes, uh, seconds long. I thought it was closer to five. And there are the number of views we've had since uh, August. August 2015. Like I said, that one's been out for five years now. And then what was I going to show you on this one? Oh, I know, I know. I was just going to show you that this was just this little temporary cardboard thing that they wrapped around the microphone, but they always made sure that the School of Medicine logo was like right there and that people were saying it. And it was just kind of entertaining to me. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not a media person, so I, I don't know how those things work, but you could definitely tell that they had a strategy that they were going to follow. And I think they were successful with it. I, the person I interviewed this morning said, oh, I watched your video. And I'm like, great, because we ask a question, you know, do you know what a cytotechnologist does? Do you know what the relationship is between a cytotechnologist and a pathologist? So it seems to be pretty informative. Um, social media is another possibility for us with our recruitment efforts. I do have something I've done for a number of years, and many of you are my friend on Facebook, and, and you know that I did the Friday photo um, and the, the students would get excited while they were learning. Like if we saw a particularly great case, they're like, oh, this should be the Friday photo. Uh, but it was only my Facebook page and it was only for my personal friends. And so this past year, we, we started an Instagram account that Josh and I both have control over. 
and we named it the Saito Friday photo. And we were careful to not do the corporate branding there because we didn't ask permission to do it. We just did it. So we don't have the big red IU on any of this. Um, the closest we come is hashtag IU Friday photo. I do cross post this on my personal Facebook account because my friends were so worried that I wasn't going to show it anymore. I'm like, I'll cross post it. But but Instagram is our main focus now for the Friday photo. We try to show something that we've been working on. Um, that Instagram account now has 625 followers. Well, actually, as of today, 633. We looked it up. Many of them are international, which is kind of fun. And we're seeing relationships develop uh, between some of the followers. Like they chat and communicate with each other. Some of them have their own Instagram accounts. It's really fun. Um, these are just the details for ours. So we named it this, we avoid corporate branding. We have a hashtag. This is how we described it. So we didn't even say that we were cytotech, cytopathologists, anything. And we accept, um, we accept new cases every week from some of our graduates who are like, I had this great case, it'd be good for the Friday photo. We never identify what graduate contributed what, we do not tell what state they are in. Um, and some of these are from our teaching sets. Some of these cases are 20 years old. You'd never know by looking at it because we don't give up that much information. So we are certain to be HIPAA compliant with our Instagram account. Um, there are lots of good Twitter accounts to follow. Just the first one that I started following and I really enjoy was Dr. Ali. He's a former president of the ASC. You know, he's out at Johns Hopkins and he just gets some great shots of some great cases. So if anybody asks me, like I talked to the residents about social media accounts, and this is one that comes up as being as being really popular is Dr. Ali's. Here's one that this was contributed by a grad and he was really happy. It was the first um, positive bronc that he'd been on. And, you know, anybody can snap a picture now with anything. So. This is actually, I believe, from my personal Facebook page, but it looks the same on uh, it looks the same on Instagram. And here, Josh liked it, and then uh, Fatima was one of our grads from a few years ago. And we actually get more traffic on the Instagram account, but people are more likely to comment on the Facebook account, which is kind of interesting. The other thing to pay attention to if you don't have corporate guidance on this is what's in your signature box on your email. Uh, I think that I added this to my signature box just a couple years ago. I mean, the video had been out five years and then I got the idea to add this. Why? Because I copied it from someone else. I saw it on someone else's. And then I also thought it looked cool to have this on my, my work email. And uh, I copied that from Nick Brell, the ClinLab program director. I showed you his picture. So now I've seen some other things like there's an IPUI specific one and it's got a little logo over here about where they rank in the, um, the US News and World Report rankings of universities. I may add another bling, another line of bling to my signature box. I haven't decided yet. So these events, take time and support of the department. Not so much me finding a good picture each week and throwing out on social media. The things that take time are traveling to Bloomington campus, even traveling here across campus with a bunch of gear because I'm gonna set up a trifold brochure and I got my rack cards and I got my plastinated organs and things like that. And so we have a multitude of reports that we have to do every year for all kinds of people. This was just our departmental report. So I report out what I do to my department of pathology, to school medicine, and to uh, uh, the university. And sometimes I can cut and paste from different reports and sometimes nobody cares. But I think this was a departmental annual review and I at, on that year had been to at least 14 events. and maybe more. It was a minimum of 14 because sometimes I lose count. Um, that year I had done the Bloomington Career Fair, with the, which is a focus on health and life science. It's not a general career fair. I had done the admissions events, which are held on different days. We had hosted five small group tours that year. And then I had been um, 
on a couple of outreach events called uh, AHEC, which is Area Health Education uh, something, consortium, I think, that was held on a neighboring campus at University of Indianapolis. And I also uh, had done this thing called Camp MD, which was for high school students. Now that's another limitation we have, and I'm gonna address that uh, in a moment. But some ideas that we've gotten uh, are things that will make sense for us to do. Like one of them is to maybe do some career fairs at the junior college level. A lot of the people with two-year degrees are interested in four-year degree and maybe they don't know what's available to them. And many of these are, are health science related programs. So we may try to, to get in touch with the junior colleges. We haven't done that yet. We just tabled that idea with the pandemic. Uh, when the RAC cards were new, so about four or five years ago, I, I traveled the state of Indiana. I, I drove to Ball State. I drove to Butler. That's just across town. I didn't take any to Marion yet. I've been to UND. I've been to Fort Wayne. And I, I set up appointments ahead of time to meet with health science advisors. And I said, I would like to meet with you. I'd like to leave some of our promotional material here explained, you know, cancer detection and that we want the best for the residents of Indiana. And I was greeted rather coldly. And now I know why. This even happens within our own campus. People want to retain headcount. And so Ball State in Muncie, Indiana, doesn't want someone to come down here for their fourth and final year. They want to retain them at Ball State and have them get a biology degree. Um, we're finding there's some inter-campus uh, dissension between us and Bloomington, Indiana. Bloomington, Indiana, which is where I did my prerequisite work, and that's where Josh did his as well, they actually removed us from the list of majors. And we found out why. It's because they want to maintain headcount in Bloomington. You know, like we can take eight students every year. I don't think that that is a big impact on the 40,000 plus in Bloomington. but. We're, we're learning the politics of how some of this works. And so I think we'll have better luck with the junior college where people are done and ready to move on than we will with other universities. Things that we don't do anymore. When this building opened in 2006, uh, there was a lot of interest and there, was, there were school groups who would come through. Well, you know, I had kids in school at this time. I know what these field trips are about. This is just like an excuse to get out of school for a day. We were trooping through uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers in this building. And uh, I led some of those tours. I, I didn't do all of them. I did some of them. I didn't particularly enjoy it. I had people pass out. I had incident reports to complete. And I just don't think they got much out of it other than a day out of school. And I didn't really feel good about them being in the lab. And then in 2009, if you recall, there was an H1N1 flu I don't know if they called it an epidemic or what at that time, but in order to protect our laboratorians, uh, which at any given time in this building, there will be about 400, they said no more visitors, no more little kids coming through. So that was great. I was really glad. The other thing that we don't do is we, we because of a rule within the Big Ten after the Jerry Sandusky uh, fiasco at Penn State, we are forbidden to have contact with anyone under the age of 18 unless we've had a specific criminal background check um, and there are other regulations that we would have to follow like we would never be in a room alone with them so if they puke or pass out we can't be the ones to take them to the bathroom uh, to to have any help with that um, it's it's been it's been a thing it's not really a problem for us because we don't think that that's where our time is best spent with middle school or high schoolers or certainly grade schoolers, but we do have uh, actual rules and restrictions to keep to keep us safe. How would you know some kid wasn't going to accuse us of doing something inappropriate? So um, 18 and up to visit our lab. And those are the things that we've been doing. And as I tend to do, I talk longer than I thought I might. But I, I wanted for you to say maybe something you've seen or heard today that you could find useful and then also something that's working for you now. And I just want to thank you um, for your time and attention. Thank you, Barb. That was wonderful um, very thorough and lots of great ideas. Um, if anybody has anything to share, maybe just put it into the comment or the chat box, please.
Barbara, oh, Sean says targeted email communication. Danielle says we've been working on building relationships with advisors at four-year colleges and universities. And um, Sean also added contact your office of communications. And Danielle has commented that they've gotten several good applicants through those relationships. Barbara, do you, um, I know that you said um, that you had the professional video done and the wrap cards. Um, those are probably big budget items. Do you have as part of your um, annual budget or however you do the budgeting, just some money set aside for any other activities. I, I don't know if any of these actually take um, additional funding. We, we do not. And so what we did, I mean, other than our time and energy, what we did that particular year with the video and the, the publication items was that Dr. Crabtree went to our administration and said, you know, our enrollment is down and it's in all of our best interests to um, to work on this. And so they they graciously uh, funded those projects, but we don't have ongoing uh, budget items. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for Barbara or any other comments you'd like to share? Just give it a few more seconds to see if uh, anybody needs some time to comment. Um, Kelly Lennon says our university developed a theater undergrad health science four-year undergraduate program. Also inviting useful public members to the advisory committee. That's a good one. That is cool. You, had, you came up with a lot of great ideas. I was very impressed. Um, well, thank you. I mean, it, and it evolved over time and it also evolved in conjunction with with other programs and other people. So I think getting over that idea we were competing for applicants was was really good. It was a really positive move. It sounds like it. And I love your um, idea of stealing other uh, other ideas that always works really well for me. I love the um, in your emails, the signature line, adding that additional information. I thought were great tips as well. Thank you. All right, well, I think we are just about at one o'clock. Um, Deb or Barbara, any last words you have for us? I know we're having another, the last strategy session um, next week. So please do register if you haven't already. Um, Barbara or Debbie, do you wanna add anything? No, oh, this is Deb. Um, I will, Barbara, it was excellent. Thank you so much for sharing everything. And moving on to next week, that information will come out this afternoon. So please do register. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you again, Barbara. This really was absolutely great. Appreciate it.